virtual community meeting series. My name is Ron Oliveira and I will be your host. This is the second community meeting that we're having virtually and we have uh, six more planned for the rest of the month so that you can learn all about Project Connect. If you wish to have closed captioning, click on the closed captioning icon, the CC in the bottom toolbar. And today we're going to share more about Project Connect, the new comprehensive transit vision for Austin and our region. Later, discussion leaders are going to be hosting a Q&A session about Project Connect with questions provided to you, the audience. But first, let's begin by sharing special messages from the Central Texas Food Bank and Workforce Solutions Capital Area. Hi, I'm Derek Chubbs, President and CEO of the Central Texas Food Bank. In normal times, the food bank and our distribution network of local food pantries, mobile pantries, soup kitchens, serve nearly 50,000 people each week in a 21 county area. But with so many of our friends and neighbors facing difficult times during this pandemic, we've seen an exponential increase in the demand for our services. And we've also had to make some drastic changes, totally revamping our food handling and distribution model in order to minimize the risk for everyone. As we work 24 seven to serve those in need through our normal channel, channels, as well as serving special drive-through food distributions. We're feeding thousands of households at these events with people lining up as early as 6 a.m. for 9 a.m. event start. And while we're seeing an unprecedented number of people, the pandemic has also caused disruptions to our food supply chain, reduced food donations from retail groceries, forcing us to purchase more food and causing us to reinvent our food distribution model. All of these things cost money and have put a terrible strain on our financial resources. What we need right now is monetary donations. This allows us to buy exactly what food we need and when we need it. We're seeing an amazing outpouring of generosity from the community, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. So if you can, please donate to the Central Texas Food Bank today by going to our website, centraltexasfoodbank.org, and clicking on the donate button. You can also raise funds with your friends and colleagues with a virtual food drive. Just go to centraltexasfoodbank.org slash virtual food drive to get started. It's really easy. And most importantly, if you need food, we're here for you. Simply go to our website, centraltexasfoodbank.org and click on the Find Food Now button. There you'll get a listing of the nearest food distributions, including two more big drive-through distributions during the month of May. Those are scheduled for Thursday, May 21st at Dell Valley High School from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And on Thursday, May 28th at the Tony Burger Center from 9 a.m. to noon. Also, watch for more events like this on our website and social media. This is Derek Chubbs. And from all of us, at the, from the staff, the board of directors, our volunteers, and partners here at the Central Texas Food Bank. Please stay safe, be good to each other, and thank you so much for your continued support. Hi, my name is Stephanie Calderon and I work for Workforce Solutions Capital Area. We connect local people to local jobs. Workforce Solutions is the local workforce development board for Travis County, one of the 28 boards across the state of Texas. We are a private, publicly funded nonprofit organization, and we are responsible for planning, oversight, and evaluation of workforce development activities in the Austin Travis County area. We are the first responders to employment during this disaster. We're helping all residents to find work right away, and we are also helping Austin's essential workers to apply for childcare assistance. All of our three locations are open. We are just operating in a virtual way to connect people in Austin to jobs in Austin. We can assist you by phone or by email, whichever you prefer. So I wanted to talk to you guys about jobs. 
We've created a tool called Jobs Now on our webpage with a list of immediate job openings for employers and people who are looking for employment. So Jobs Now features more than 800 openings and we update this list every day so you can search for immediate work on Jobs Now by visiting our website at www.wfscapitalarea.com. As Texas reopens, more businesses will have more positions and opportunities. We will work with those employers um, to get those jobs onto work in Texas, so that way the state job searching website is available for you to access and view. If you are new to work in Texas, we can help you navigate the entire process from registering for an account to posting and updating your resume to applying for your position. If you want to uh, get assistance with this, go ahead and give us a call at 512-549-4967 to get started. Many of Austin's essential workers are parents and caregivers, and we offer assistance to help them do their jobs knowing that their children are cared for in a safe, nurturing environment. Workforce Solutions can connect essential workers with open providers accepting new children to provide tuition assistance to help cover the cost for childcare. If you are an essential worker and you need assistance, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 512-549-4967 and press option five. Or you can email us at ccsaustin at wfscapitalarea.com. When we return to work, some residents may wanna pursue a new career in a new industry. How about joining Austin Semiconductor Manufacturing Industry? We're enrolling eligible residents right now for an online training program in June and July, and it's going to be to become a production technician. The classes are taught all online through Austin Community College, and they run about six to eight weeks long. We will connect graduates with local manufacturers who are ready to hire. We want to enroll you guys as soon as we can, so if you're ready, you can give us a call at 512-597-7224. Thank you. And let's extend a big to Workforce Solutions and the Capital Area Food Bank for all that they normally do, but especially uh, coming together right now and helping so many people during the coronavirus crisis. We thank our community partners for sharing these updates. It's great to see that we have come together during this difficult time. So before we get started, let's go over some of the logistics for today's meeting. Participants are going to be muted the entire hour and the chat will be disabled. This is being done in order to ensure our discussion leaders can see and answer questions through designated Q&A channels. You're going to be able to submit questions for the discussion in a variety of ways. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can ask a question by clicking on the QA icon in the or at the bottom. If you're watching on Facebook Live right now, you can ask questions by adding a comment on the post. Or you can call or text 512-662-1750, that's 662-1750, and you can submit your questions in English or Spanish. Questions will not appear publicly until they're answered. If we don't get to your question, they're going to be included in the FAQ documents available on the Project Connect website. Now, let's proceed. I want to hand it over for opening remarks now to Capital Area Met or Capital Metro President and CEO Randy Clark. He's going to have some opening remarks, and then he's going to introduce our discussion leaders for today's meeting. Good afternoon, Randy. Hey, Ron. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, doing this. Uh, I'm glad you're involved in all of our community chats. So uh, I'll take a few minutes just to say hi to everyone. Uh, appreciate you dedicating your time uh, today. We're trying to spread these out at different times uh, during the week. Hopefully this will get a, a new group of people involved that haven't had the opportunity yet. We've engaged over 40,000 people in the Project Connect process the last two years. It has been an enormous amount of effort, but there's obviously always more to do. We're bombarded by information 24-7, uh, and it's almost impossible sometimes to get through that uh, uh, bombardment of information, but we're, we are certainly trying our best as a community. Uh, I'll say a couple of introductory comments, and then I want to welcome our, our special guest today. So um, you're going to hear a little bit later some Cap Metro specific uh, details related to COVID-19, and I'll go through those relatively quickly because we do want to spend as much time as possible Project Connect and the... Um, and, your, and your input and your questions. But I will say we are laser focused on the response today. I'm very proud of our workforce, the men and women, especially on the front line, they're out there driving buses and trains and doing a great job getting essential workers throughout our community and doing things like at our food banks. Um, 
But as much as we're focused on today, we have to be focused also on the future. One foot in the present, one foot in the future. We, we know we have major uh, issues, both as a city and a society, that we have to uh, uh, deal with. And those are policy issues like things like equity. And this, this emergency has probably ripped the Band-Aid off the, the exposure of our inequities in our society more than anything else and access to jobs and healthcare and education and why that's is such critical for everyone to have a fair chance. Climate change, we all have fresh air all over the world, magically now because we are not doing, you know, so we gotta think about uh, flattening the carbon curve, if you will, and how transit is a big part of that. Traffic is gonna be back. Some people are already saying today is back a little bit. Traffic's coming back and jobs. For every billion dollars in transit, we raise about 20,000 jobs, good paying jobs. So. We at Cab Metro are focused on the future. We know um, as a city and as a region, we're gonna go from two to four million people. We have to invest in our infrastructure to manage that. I think it's fair to say that we haven't done that historically. It's where we are today. And some of our infrastructure of the past has actually divided our community. We need to invest in infrastructure that connects our community together and makes us a, a fairer, better city that's more sustainable long-term. Because people are gonna move here one way or the other. And most people are saying that not only will Austin not suffer through the recession as much as other cities, we'll probably come out faster and that it might accelerate even more people moving here because Austin is such a high quality place to live. So with all that, I just, you know, I want to say we are very much focused on Project Connect for the future because we know it's, we cannot have the livable city we all want without some addressing of our infrastructure to help manage all of those ideas I mentioned. So this has been a nonstop effort between Cap Metro and the city. I want to thank all the Cap Metro staff and, uh, and also our city staff partner who just been just amazing to work with the last few years. Um, but then it comes down to policymakers. And policymakers, uh, I think, you know, the public should feel really great that we've had uh, seven joint sessions between the Cap Metro board and the city council. And they were working so well together and it seems very much almost universally focused on how we need to do a significant transmit uh, in, in this community. So I'm going to take a second and introduce some of our special guests and then I'll ask them to say a few words too because the staff at the end of the day puts all the good information together, works with the community to design what is a recommendation, but the policymakers have to do you know, the, the hard piece which is decide uh, which type of investment they may want to make uh, for, for this community. So um, First, I'll mention uh, our, our board member, Ann Kitchen, is listening in. She's only with us for a small amount of time. She's not, uh, she'll be hosting uh, another meeting coming up, but um, she is a big champion of transit and is on our Cap Metro board and on the city council. Then we have uh, my board member, Jeff Trevelyan. He's the uh, county commissioner of Precinct 1, Jeff Trevelyan. And I'll ask him to say a moment in a second. And then District 1 council member, uh, Natasha Harbour Madison, she's waving right there right now. Um, who is so both Jeff and Natasha? I really appreciate them being here. They're uh, you're know, really talking about how transit is needed for things like equity, transportation, jobs, access, and I, I'm just really just I love their commitment in trying to uh, move a program forward, and they're positive about how we can be a better community. So I think maybe uh, first off, I will let uh, you know my board my board uh, member uh, Jeff Trevelyan, if he has a few moments to make some intro comments, we'd love to hear from him. I'll try to keep it to a few moments, um, but, but I think the uh, most important thing to say is it is hard to argue that you have a really significant city if that city does not have an effective public transit system. Uh, public transit defines how most of us uh, get to work every day, get to the doctor, get to all of our public necessities. And it is important to recognize that uh, for a lot of people, their, their uh, public transit is actually their car. And we've, got, and we've got to look at it in that way. How can we make sure that we're looking at all parts of the city and making sure that we're connecting the uh, folks to places uh, where they work, where they play, where they, where they are, or have to be involved from a civic standpoint. Uh, so uh, I have been uh, really honored to work with Cap Metro and Cap Metro's team. Uh, we have worked together this year to do things like uh, putting pickup services in, in parts of town that have historically been hard to get to, whether we're talking about University Hills, St. David, the Manor area, whether we're talking about um, going into the Norwood community and, uh, and standing up a, a, 
a facility that seven buses can uh, can uh, stop at and have six bus routes coming out of there, two that leave every 15 minutes in an area that had been considered a transit desert. Uh, it is possible for us to work on equity and make sure that we connect the entire city and still grow our transit uh, or opportunities around the entire city. And it's important that we do look at those historically underserved areas as we do so. Uh, I, have, I have been pleased with the commitment of, of this administration, and I have been pleased with uh, the commitment of my fellow board members and, and council members and county commissioners as well. Uh, but we only are able to solve the problems that the community defines for us. Uh, your engagement is absolutely necessary for us to make sure that we are solving problems in a way that will be meaningful to communities. So uh, it's important for me to hear from people who use the bus every day, people who, uh, who feel that there are other opportunities to serve them. And when we hear those things, uh, we will work with our colleagues to try to address them. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to work with you today. And I'm looking forward to hearing what the community has to say. Thank you, board member. Appreciate it. Uh, I guess now we'll go to District uh, 1, Council Member Natasha Harbour Madison. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. And uh, feel free to maybe make some comments to, uh, it looks like we have a fair amount of people already online listening to us. So you're on mute. We'll have to unmute you. There we go. Okay. So two things. One, Randy Clark, when did you get her cut? Uh, my wife uh, took took the buzz clippers to me a couple days ago. I couldn't I couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> Thanks for uh, the obvious compliment. <laughs> You're welcome. And then the other thing is, Ron Oliveira. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but when I tell you, I'm trying to age you. But oh my gosh, I am fangirling right now. Did I go to your first grade class many moons ago? That's what ends up people always say. Now they're growing up and successful like you are. That's wonderful. Well, uh, good to see you, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. So I will say this. I think Jeff already touched on some of the things that I would otherwise say. But I'll say this. Um, we can't let this short-term problem, um, like the pandemic, discourage us from considering long-term investments. We have got to make Austin better. We have to make it safer. We have to make it greener. We have to make it more equitable and more affordable. And like our city should just be a more accessible city. So the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan calls for a compact and connected city, right? So we used to have that in theory, but Austin had a streetcar network that connected north to south, west to east, and then back around. That was back when Hyde Park was considered the northern suburb. But then, like so many other American cities, we put all our eggs in one basket, and we decided to plan our growth exclusively around cars. That gives us that gives us pollution. That gives us countless deaths and, and fear. Uh, an effective mandate, basically, that if you don't want to fully participate in our economy, or if you do want to rather, then you have to have a car. So, in my mind's eye, the Project Connect vision, the program, like Randy likes to call it, it's a program. I get it. Um, what they're offering us there is something just more mindful about the overall bigger picture. Um, and so I, I think it will provide trust. It will provide true mass transit options for all of us that will not only attract riders who could otherwise choose to drive, but also enhance the quality of life of people who like Commissioner Villian said, depend on transit. So we have an option here that really does take the opportunity to really just be so much more mindful about what people's needs are. 
and how we meet those needs. So the city's partnership with Cap Metro, it, it's never been better. And together we are positioned in a way that we can take action that will prevent displacement and leverage our transit oriented developments. That way we can create more affordable housing and build complete communities that open up opportunities to all of us. So Austin is in a way behind the curve, you know, and we have to recognize that. But at the same time, this plan is like strapping on a rocket booster, right? You know, and to some degree, not only can we catch up with other cities, but we can jump out and be the lead. We can be what other cities look to in terms of the model, in which case I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, granted, these days are hard, right? And everybody's tired. Everybody's a little, you know, feeling a little low, but I'm optimistic. I really feel like if it's a generational investment that we have the opportunity to make right now, then it's badly needed. Let's do it. And I'm so excited to be involved in what is truly a historic moment for our city. So thank y'all for having me. I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of the dialogue. I think this is so needed. And, you know, the, the conversation has to happen, but us having it in a way that we really are diving into the things that are complex and difficult in terms of how to accomplish it. Um, I recognize that too. So thanks for having me. Hey, th thank you very much, Council Member. Appreciate it. And I'll mention uh, both Council, uh, Council Member Harper Madison and Board Member Trevelyan both did some trips with us this summer. We did some due diligence trips and I appreciate them taking time out of their busy schedule. Uh, we tried to go to four different cities around uh, the United States this summer, uh, or last, last summer. <laughs> month, day, everything seems to be blended together right now. Uh, but I appreciate their time looking at some of our peers because I think uh, what you mentioned is, is true. We, we have to do something. And it's been a 20-year conversation. And all of our peers have not done have done major investments to try to address these uh, policy concerns. So uh, Austin's time is certainly here to, to finally move, move this topic along. So thank, thank you again. I guess, Ron, do I uh, turn it back to you right at the moment? Uh, Randy, you were going to talk a little bit about what's happening with Cap Metro right now in this time of COVID. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you for keeping me on, on the runner show here. I remember what we're supposed to do. Uh, why don't I take a quick, quick moment? Um, it looks like Lon, Lonnie might be putting up uh, the, the two slides I'll kick off with. But in meanwhile, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. Um, just really want to thank, again, our frontline staff. Just doing an incredible job for our community. Uh, we're still moved 1.3 million trips, and this is as of last week, during the last 40 days. So those are people like these nurses on the left in that picture to, you know, people that stock shelves at HEB or Randall's or the CVS Pharmacy or Leaners, you name it. We are getting people out there that are the foundation of our economy and getting us all through this. We're also doing everything we can to partner with as many organizations to keep the most vulnerable in our community fed and transported. So we still do several hundred trips a day for life-saving dialysis. That's been almost 25,000 of those kinds of trips that are just beyond important for, for people uh, out there in our community. We delivered, I think now we're up to 230,000 meals delivered with our partnership with the Food Bank and uh, HEB and Good Apple. Th that, my understanding, we were the first in the United States to do that program, very innovative, and I want to give a lot of credit to our team to think through that, and then we introduced that concept uh, through our industry association. I think there's 30 or 40 cities now around the country that have followed our lead in doing that, but that's getting it so the people that are most vulnerable to getting this virus are able to stay home, stay safe, and we will deliver uh, home care kits to them, and that is an amazing thing to do. We already do great cleaning here at Cap Metro. Safety is our number one priority on everything we do, and Board Member Trevelyan mentions that a lot at a lot of our meetings. It is the foundation of the transit industry. We've had an enormous amount of work into things like PPE for our staff, 
Uh, we did three weeks of supplemental sick time for all of our staff, and that was before Congress recommended two weeks. We, we want our staff, if they feel sick or have any issues at home, not to feel pressure to come to work. We got their back. Uh, they are critical staff that we need to perform our mission. We also gave one-time um, bonus for community service recognition, so during the entire stay at shelter at place order, we gave a special bonus per week for all the staff that, that, uh, that was at work on the front lines doing that work, and we were very happy to do that. They're incredible people. They've done a great job, and they deserve that. Uh, but everything from gloves and PP, you know, masks to hand sanitizer by gallon and gallon and gallon. Uh, our buses, we did rear door entry. We wanted to do spacing on board the vehicles. We will continue to monitor, we'll continue to adjust, we'll continue to either lead or learn best practices from around the country. We're replacing seating right now. We're doing operator barriers installation. We're, we've actually re, uh, did some service adjustments, started today with some new service. We're gonna crawl, walk, run, and go upstairs as this thing comes together. Everything we do will be based on, on under the lens of safety and equity. Safety for our staff and our customers and equity for the people that need service the most. We will make sure that we have those lines in operation as staff availability and, um, and demand grows, then we'll ramp up to cover the entire full spectrum of our service. But that is the lens of which we will bring back service. So I want to highlight those things though because our staff are your neighbors. The people you go to church with or your kids play Little League with, they are a great part of our community. We have 2,000 members of our, our team strong. They work, live, and play here. And they just want to always take the chance publicly to recognize all that they do. So with that, and, and, and for people watching, to know how much we know you need transit to operate well for this community, and we are gonna make sure it's safe to get people back on board and get you where you need to go. So with that, Ron, uh, I think what we could do is transition it back to you, and we'll do the whole Project Connect piece, and of course, I'll be here for uh, Q&A when, when we wrap this up. That's exactly right. Great plan in action. Thank you so much, Randy. We are gonna hear more from Randy, as well as Natasha and Jeff. They're gonna be taking your questions just a little bit later during this uh, virtual meeting. But first, we wanna to get to a polling question that you, we want you to answer involved with, and then we'll dive into the overview of the Project Connect system plan. And so the big question is here right now, you know, is how familiar are you with Capital Metro's Project Connect plan? That's why we're here, we're gonna talk about it. First response would be project what? You've never heard about it. Uh, second response, I've seen an ad or two. I know a little tiny bit about it. I know enough to have a short conversation about Project Connect. And the final response would be, I know a lot about Project Connect. I'm a Project Connect expert. Please vote. Okay, well, there we go. Now we have your responses. Thanks for the quick response too. How familiar are you with Capital Metro's Project Connect plan? The majority say at 48%, I know enough to have a short conversation. That's good. We're gonna help even more this afternoon. Second biggest response was, I'm a Project Connect expert. That's with 28% of you all responding, okay? 14% said, I know a little bit about it. I've seen an ad or two. And 10% uh, are pretty much in the dark about Project What? They don't know much about Project Connect. So that's why we are here to inform you today and in the coming months. So now let's jump into it. And as a reminder, feel free to ask questions through Zoom, Facebook Live, or call or text 512 662-1750 in English or Spanish. If we don't get to your questions, it's gonna be included in the frequently asked documents, question documents, that's gonna be posted in the coming week. Now, here's an expert on Project Connect. It's a system plan, and it's gonna be presented by Jacob Calhoun. Jacob, take it away. Thank you, Ron. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jacob Calhoun. I'm the principal planner for Project Connect here at Cap Metro. I've been working on this project uh, ever since we got started creating the vision plan back in 2016 and get to see it kind of evolve and progress as we continue to move forward with the program. Um, I'll give a quick presentation over where we are uh, and where we're going to be over the next couple of months and uh, years. We've been going out in Project Connect for years now. Uh, 
ever since we kind of restarted this process back in 2016, getting the vision plan created and then getting that adopted in December. Uh, we've also been working actively with the community and our partners over at the city of Austin as they develop their Austin strategic mobility plan and getting that adopted back in April of 2019. We've held multiple joint work sessions with the city council and our Cap Metro board to go over various aspects of the program, whether that's the funding, the governance, or other technical details. Right now, we are holding our virtual community meetings and have a virtual open house that's ready for people to access and be able to learn more about the project. And we'll have other milestones as we continue to go forward on this project and a continued community engagement throughout it. We've been listening and learning a lot from y'all. And so we've heard of more than 40,000 community members engaging through our various outreach programs, plus all the other outreach that we did with the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan. We try to use a variety of different avenues uh, to reach out to people, including having various stakeholder groups that we've continuously engaged throughout the process. As I mentioned, we've had numerous city council and cap metro joint work sessions. We'll have more in the future as well. Uh, we're also hosting this uh, virtual engagement. That's the virtual open house. Uh, right now you're in the middle of a virtual community meeting, but if uh, you want to access more information on our project at a time. And that's not uh, at this one, you can access at any time and look at as far as you want into the project at the virtual open house, which is located uh, quickly, easily, accessibly from projectconnect.com and we'll be holding that virtual open house up into the end of May. Having Project Connect really does help us expand our transit envelope in the city and really creates a network that we can connect lots of communities and make sure that we help address some of these historical inequities to access to jobs or healthcare or education and it's really trying to help provide a more sustainable and revitalized city that we can really help out and make sure that we continue to grow into the future. We'll build Project Connect on top of our existing services to make sure that we can do our part to help ease traffic. So now I'll give a quick overview of what the recommended system plan is that we're proposing as part of Project Connect and give you some more details on the various aspects of the program. So Project Connect really is about living up to its name of connecting people. So here you can see an overview of the recommended system plan that we have proposed. And it's really a system built on connections. You can also find this map online at our virtual open house or on projectconnect.com where you can look into more detail as the different aspects of the program. Here I'll go into more detail on the various components of the recommended system plan. We have three light rail lines the orange, blue, and gold. This is light rail in its own dedicated space and allows it to move freely without having to get interference with traffic. That's 36 miles, 40 stations, including a downtown transit tunnel. We're also going to be expanding the Metro Rapid service by providing seven new routes, uh, nearly 75 miles and nearly 200 stations worth of them. So that way we can cover more places, allowing for a high frequent service that's able to connect more people to more places they're trying to go. We'll also be expanding the Metro Rail service as well, which is our commuter rail line. We'll be improving our existing red line, plus adding a brand new commuter rail service in the green line that will connect downtown to Colony Park with potential extensions to Maynard and Elgin. We'll also be expanding our Metro Express service by providing eight new routes branching out throughout the rest of the region. We'll also be expanding our parking rides by adding 24 new parking rides that allow you the option to get out of your car, and get onto transit, and get the rest of where you're going. We'll also be expanding and improving our Metro bus and Metro access services. Plus, on top of all that, we'll be moving towards an all-electric fleet, helping improve the air quality of our region. We'll also be improving our 
um, customer technology allowing for a mobile pass that you'll be able to access via smart card or smartphone and give you a variety of mobility options. We'll be expanding our uh, circulators and pickup zones uh, throughout the region allowing for quick options to connect to your neighborhood to where transit services and other areas around it. We'll also be adding uh, improvements to our existing maintenance facilities and improving new maintenance facilities in order to make sure that the entire program is running smoothly. Traffic can be overwhelming. And with the city's projected growth, we need more options. Project Connect creates an expanded regional transit network to benefit us all. And it's built with the future in mind. We're expanding current transit services and making them more convenient and easier to use. That means more service for us all with improvements to local bus service, more investments in accessibility, seven new Metro rapid routes, and 24 regional park and rides to connect customers into the system. Neighborhood circulators like Pickup provide quick trips, connect to additional transportation options, and improve accessibility. Multiple light rail lines will allow the system to move more people with greater speed and reliability. And using transit will be even simpler. With your smartphones or smart fare cards, you can plan trips and pay for fares, plus future integrations to pay for and reserve parking bike rentals, and other smart city options. Capital Metro is committed to helping Central Texas become a cleaner, healthier place by moving toward an all-electric, zero-emissions fleet. It's time to create more options for moving through our growing city. Capital Metro's Project Connect. It's go time. And here you can see what a light rail vehicle in blue on the left would look like and what a bus rapid transit metro rapid vehicle in red on the right would look like compared to each other. The, these are both the all electric vehicles to make sure that we're improving our air quality. Inside the metro rapid vehicle, you can clearly see throughout the entire vehicle and while also being able to look at infotainment uh, centers that allow for people to know where they're going while they're riding the vehicle. There's also plenty of comfortable seating and places for you to connect with your bike or your smartphone on a climate controlled environment. Here you can see what a light rail vehicle would look like in the city street at an intersection. You can see that we are trying to fit these vehicles within the natural and built environment, allowing for other uses of the road, such as bicycles, pedestrians, landscapes, car traffic, just making sure that it fits with everything else that's around it as a natural part of the environment. So that's what the light rail would look like above ground. Here's what it could look like in the downtown transit tunnel.
we have what a underground station could look like in this rendering. This is what the Republic Square station could look like downtown. And you have a nice open area for people to move about and get on and off the vehicles uh, with dual access doors, similar to what you would see at an airport shuttle, allowing for people to quickly and safely get on and off the vehicles. All in a well ventilated, climate controlled area, so that way when it's hot and over 100 degrees in July and August, you'll be nice and cool underground, still moving about where you're trying to go. And if we go up the escalators, you can come to the mezzanine level. This is where we'd have lots of local food and drink vendors, as well as shops and other places for people to kind of really access the culture and the amenities that people love about Austin. This, of course, would be all air conditioned and have access to public restrooms, uh, ticket information centers, and other amenities people are looking for. Uh, similar to like you're going to the airport and you uh, go through the concourse area before you get to your gate. That's how this kind of area of the mezzanine would feel. Here we have an example of what a potential park and ride station could look like. So you've got plenty of ways to access the actual facility, whether that's uh, driving to it, biking to it, scooting to it, uh, using electric vehicles, using gas-powered vehicles, all in a nice environment that's iconic and easy for you to recognize and know where you are. It will allow you to connect to a variety of cat metro services, whether that's buses or trains or even some of our pickup and drop-off services as well. Larger parking rides like this concept of regional transportation center would have plenty of options for housing and shops and mixed uses to connect you whenever you're getting on and off the services. Uh, it would be plenty of parking, plus maybe at a uh, parking garage, uh, allow for more people to access it. Connections to the light rail, connections to our Metro Rapid, but also connections to other regional transit services such as Megabus or Greyhound, allowing you to go even further through the area and through the state. The next couple of slides, I'll provide a little bit more detail on some of the community benefits that the program will provide to people. The Project Connect program is all about trying to help us achieve the goals that we have a, as a region have wanted for ourselves, whether that's improving our traffic, uh, providing more transit options for everybody and getting better equity for people to move around the region, uh, improving our quality of life, the quality of our air, and even just the quality of the way we get around. We want to be able to provide more access to jobs, healthcare, education, and other things we're trying to get to. Investing in Project Connect is an investment for today that will help the future generations and many years to come. It's really important that we invest in our local economy as part of Project Connect. For every billion dollars spent, there's approximately 22,000 jobs that are created. With everything that's going on right now and needing job security, creating big investment opportunities like this is a huge way to help keep the economy stable and allow people to continue to have places to work, even when times get hard. For every dollar spent in investing in transit, it approximately generates $4 in economic returns. That's more money staying in the local economy, helping the people that use the system. Project Connect is not just about transit, though. We'll also be improving the active transportation investments that are out there for people to get around, whether that's biking or walking. Through our partnership with the City of Austin's Corridor Program, we'll be help building 90 miles of sidewalks, 72 miles of bike lanes, and investing nearly $200 million into active transportation mobility improvements. We've covered a lot of ground on Project Connect so far, but we still have a ways to go and obviously we continue to move forward. I'll now turn it over to Greg Canale, who is the Deputy Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Jacob. I uh, appreciate all that information you're able to provide. Uh, I want to welcome everyone again to uh, this afternoon's uh, virtual town hall on Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, as Jacob said, I'm Greg Canale with the City of Austin, the Deputy CFO. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Trevelyan there, waving over there, and uh, Councilmember Harper Madison. Thank you for your support and leadership on this effort. And I'm really pleased to be able to join the two of you today as well as everyone uh, with us. 
the, as Jacob said, the next kind of few slides I'd like to walk you through is how do we look at the Project Connect program that Cap Metro has put together with the community and how can we lift it off of the map uh, and put it into ground um, and put it into reality. So what we've been working on with our partnership with Cap Metro, I really do want to echo what Randy and Jacob have said and uh, Trevelyan and, and Councilmember Harper Madison, the relationship and the collaboration um, on this effort this time around has been really fantastic. I've been with the city for a long time and um, it's a really strong foundation that we have between the two organizations. And I think that's really important for the public to see their two governmental entities work so well together, especially at this time. Key to taking this Project Connect program and, and moving it forward, at the core that is building off of that trust of the foundations that have been built, uh, again, with the CAP Metro Board and the City Council meeting seven times, with the staffs working together, we wanna to formalize that transit partnership on a forward going basis. And what that looks like here is really a, a formalized partnership framework that both the City of Austin would be putting funding in as well as CAP Metro funding, including the federal funds that they can bring down from the uh, FTA at the federal government. And this joint partnership would really focus on government governance and implementation. The governance side is to make sure that what the voters have approved would be would be would move forward. Financing of the entire effort, and then at a core in the beginning is the continued planning and implementation to make sure that. It's being done well, and it's also tying back to both things at the city and Cap Metro and along with, uh, with the neighborhoods throughout the city. Ultimately, when completed, the projects would be turned back over to Cap Metro as the region's operator for transit. Core to this framework, we see several things. One is the transparency um, of the entire effort, um, a single entity that can be focused on it. But most importantly is the city council and the capture board will retain oversight over the long haul of this. Again, a new independent board that can quickly act to get things done with really strong tiebacks to our city council and cap metro. So what does this look like? Jacob laid out the entire program and let's put some cost around that. Uh, Project Connect team has been working uh, on this effort. And what we have right now is a total of about $10 billion program uh, with the various components listed here. The orange, blue, and gold line are high capacity transit with the tunnel, downtown tunnel. There is more investments in uh, regional rail with the green line uh, and enhancements to the red line, as well as expanded bus uh, service throughout the uh, community. Overall, again, this is at 10 billion. And what I think we should focus on here is the, is the local share versus the, the federal share. We're estimating around 40% federal, but hope we can grow that. Um, so of the 10 billion locally, that's about 6 billion and 4 billion from the fed, federal government. As Jacob mentioned on his economic impact, for every dollar spent, $4 locally uh, has an impact. If, if, a, if of our dollar, half of that can be paid by the federal government, that is really even a, a broader leveraging opportunity that we think is a really great opportunity in these times. So, how would we do this? How would we about funding this? I want to share some of the ideas that we have with you. First, again, is that federal funding coming from the uh, federal government, FTA. Cap Metro has existing funds um, from, its, from how it operates its system long term. There should be some additional funds that we can put at this project. And ultimately, the city of Austin. The city of Austin, uh, the property tax rate, the property tax election, we can look at funding not only the capital, which we've been able to look at in the past, but so critically the operations and maintenance of the system in the long term, as well as the state of good repairs. We read a lot around the country where transit agencies and some of the projects they have long term fall into disrepair. We think on the front end, we want to have a viable and stable funding source to make sure that the system that the voters vote for um, can, can last. So looking at that, um, moving on to the next slide. There we go. We, we've, we've ranged out a few sequencing opportunities to look at what this could cost um, for this property tax uh, enhancement, the, the, the tax rate election. This really depends on the sequencing about how quickly we could build the system out between 15 and 30 years. What we're looking at is additional tax revenue, uh, somewhere between six and a half cents and 13 cents, uh, between $18 and $37 a month. To put that in perspective, 
um, for the average taxpayer, the tax bill, that's about a 3% to about a 6% increase that we're looking at to fund that $10 billion system, plus, again, the operations. So how do we move forward from here and taking these ideas and, and, and moving forward, working with our elected, bo elected bodies, the city council and the CAP Metro board? The next slide lays out how we see uh, moving forward on this. Again, here we are in May doing these virtual town hall meetings. Again, we really appreciate you taking the time from your days to join us. We're focused on June 10th. There'll be a, an additional joint work session between the city council and the CAP Metro board for them to adopt the system plan. And then in July and August, uh, both entities move into their budget cycles um, and City of Austin begins its budget process in July with budget hearings on July 13th uh, and the 23rd and the 30th and CAP Metro also looks at it uh, on July 27th. In August, we would look at action from uh, the City Council as well as CAP Metro in terms of looking at a, tra a transit referendum and adopting a budget. And then we fast forward to this potential tr transit referendum in early November. So again, that's how we see we can move from taking the system plan, moving through financing and governance and putting it potentially in front of the voters and ultimately giving our policy uh, leaders enough information for them to, to look at this in August. So with that, I'll turn it back to Ron. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Greg and Jacob, for that uh, great overview. And before, a lot of information to digest, but that's why we're here, folks. Uh, to, to inform you and uh, also for you to ask questions about what may have not been presented. So before moving on, one more time, we're going to have a polling question for you and then we're going to begin our discussion. Okay, next question. How comfortable do you feel talking to your friends and colleagues about Project Connect? First, I'm very comfortable. I'll bring it up at our next Zoom happy hour that so many people are having these days. Second response, somewhat comfortable. I'd like to know what my friends think. Third response, not sure how I feel. I'll visit projectconnect.com. I'll go to the web so I can learn more. And the final response is not comfortable. I'll send my friends over to projectconnect.com so that they can learn more. Please vote now. By the way, Capital Metro has set up a virtual Open house, it's gonna be open until May 31st. You can be reached by visiting projectconnect.com, selecting virtual meeting, that's on the homepage. Here are the results of the poll we just took. It looks like 55% of our respondents here say they're very comfortable talking to their friends and colleagues about Project Connect. A second response was that with 28%, somewhat comfortable. I'd like to know uh, uh, what my think. Third response is with 14%, not sure how I feel. I'll visit projectconnect.com to learn more. And 3% only say they're not comfortable. I'll send my friends over to projectconnect.com so that they can learn more information, okay? There you have it. Those are the results of our poll. Now I'd like to reintroduce our council members, Natasha Harper-Madison from District 1 here in Austin and Travis County Commissioner, Precinct 1 and Capital Board, uh, Metro Board member, Jeff Trebillion. And once again, Cap Metro CEO, Randy Clark, and uh, a Project Connect senior planner, Jacob Calhoun, who gave us the overview, and they're looking forward to helping out with any technical questions that you may have. Our first question goes to you, council member. Uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm just getting here on my, uh, my text. Pardon me real quick. First one goes to council member Harper Madison. One attendee is concerned about potential displacement along Project Connect's proposed lines. What's the city doing to ensure equity and to prevent displacement? I think that's a perfectly fair and valid question. So what we're talking about here is mobility primarily, right? But it's also an opportunity for us to address equity, for us to address safety and affordability and the environment. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, we have not uh, had the opportunity um, to have a broad conversation about transit-oriented development. You can't have a city develop without recognizing the symbiotic relationship between how transit works and how development works. And so that's going to be one of those conversations that we have to have. 
and moving forward through this dialogue about transit, you're going to have to talk about how we develop as a city, how we move through recognizing that, you know, like, for example, East Side Metro Rapid routes that connect to East Austin and light rail lines have to inherently improve access to schools and hospitals and jobs and services and stores. And so all of this is directly connected. So I, I think this is inherently a part of a larger conversation and action, frankly, that we have to take as a city. Very good. Thank you so much, Natasha. Randy, this question is for you. What's the difference between the current metro rail line and the proposed light rail line? Sure, uh, good question. We get that actually a lot. Uh, and I think it's probably a lack of familiarity with large transit uh, infrastructure in Austin. So Metro Rail Red Line is basically what most people in the country refer to as commuter rail. The idea is stations are further apart. Trains are actually regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration versus uh, light rail is more urban rail, kind of uh, integrated, as J Jacob mentioned in his presentation, to the corridor, less... Um, um, stations closer together, little small, uh, shorter and uh, or, uh, less speed, smaller vehicles. The idea is on and off, uh, much more integrated to development uh, and, and placemaking along the corridor. Commuter rail is really designed primarily to serve more suburban kind of commuter, although we've kind of taken our red line and we're trying to do two things at the same time with a piece of infrastructure. It's just the, uh, the type of where, where it's positioned in our community. So the green line, uh, on the map would look like the red line, which again, stations are supposed to be far apart because the trains take a while to ramp up speed and then have to break and slow down. They're really designed to spread through more of a regional rail where gold, orange, and blue, those three are light rail, urban rail, and designed really in urban corridors that you would see in more dense and uh, kind of developed areas. Very good. Thank you, Randy. For Commissioner Trevelyan, this question for you. How are you working to involve communities along these lines in future development plans and ensuring that all voices are being heard? Well, we have done a number of things uh, as, as we've worked internally first uh, with, with, uh, with the um, employees at Cap Metro. Uh, we have asked first that uh, we start meeting with community members where they congregate. Uh, rather than creating meetings and asking them to come downtown, uh, we have been working with neighborhood associations, we've been working with PTAs, uh, we have been working with communities where communities reside and work. Um, uh, just to, uh, to comment on the question that our council member <coughs> Harper Madison asked, uh, you know, what we have been focusing on is where our affordable housing is going. Uh, when you look at Colony Park, that is a place uh, where we have put three projects into place over the last uh, two years. When you look at Colony Park, uh, the, the Beckett is a project that we supported out there, which is the best multifamily housing in the area. We've been looking at the 969 corridor, we've been looking at the 290 corridor, and what we've been asking the folks who are developing affordable housing is, have you worked with your ISDs and the PTAs uh, that support them? Have you sat down with Cap Metro and the representatives uh, to see what the closest uh, bus stops are to you and how we can get people uh, to them effectively? Have we sat down with Central Health uh, to look at the places where clinics exist or where there, uh, where there are uh, local schools where clinics can be co-located? So the whole discussion has to go around uh, where, uh, where are we uh, working in communities and who are we bringing to the table to discuss issues. And we've been working through our community organizations, through our ISDs, and through our healthcare providers to make sure that our community is engaged. Very good. Thank you so much, Jeff. Next question goes to Randy and Greg Canale, who had given us the financial overview. This plan is going to cost billions of dollars. How does this cost structure compare to other cities building similar systems? Whoever wants to go first. Sure. Well, I'll make a couple comments, Greg, and if you feel if you want to join, uh, jump in. So, um, yes, there's no question. Uh, you know, someone, I can't remember what public meeting said the best. Civilization costs money. 
So we have to have investments if we're gonna have cities that work. Uh, and there's no getting around this. Uh, it will cost money. Uh, but you know, the question is, what's the cost if we don't do something? I think is, is just as actually uh, an important uh, calculation. So all of our cost basis on the Cap Metro side in the cost estimates, whether it's X billion for the orange line versus this for a rapid line, are all based on basically industry standards. So we, we have a comprehensive analysis team. Uh, Jacob is part of that. Uh, lots of other uh, work that's done in modeling, and we've looked at places like Denver or Seattle, Minneapolis, you know, people that are our peers and projects they are either in the design process or that they've actually already constructed. In the transit industry, the Federal Transit Administration makes you go through a very specific process to get to those outputs of a model. So we feel very confident about those cost estimates. We actually had an independent third-party peer review come in did a whole analysis of that and presented to uh, a, a joint meeting of the Catro board and city council to talk about, the, uh, about those numbers. Everything is open and transparent it's on projectconnect.com. Uh, we've shown those at various stages through, through the process of the joint meetings. So I encourage people to go on there and look at, uh, look at those numbers and kind of how those numbers equal outputs a benefit to the community. So Greg, I don't know if you have anything to add from a financial side. Well, I think just real quick, Randy, I, I think the, the key to the, our, our, the potential approach here is going to the voters, going to the Austinites and, and getting them to weigh in on this. And with that, putting in front of them what would be a dedicated revenue stream. That's what we see around the country. Folks are, 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 are setting up a revenue stream, again, that can fund the program as well as make sure the operation. So instead of trying to uh, move buckets around, we think it was the most transparent thing to do to look at a, a dedicated revenue source um, that can get this build and taking it to the voters. All right, this next question is for the group. Anybody can answer first. How will Project Connect help people on the outskirts of Austin, whether Southwest or Northeast, connect people to jobs, healthcare, and other opportunities around the region? Well, I, don't, I, I guess I can, I'll add some intro comments and anyone wants to jump in. So I, I, I would say everything I tell the team is always crawl, walk, run. So, right, we, we have major needs in our community and they're all over every part of our, not only our city, but our region. And as a region, we got to get tighter together as a region. We got to get less siloed from government agencies and jurisdictions and all work together. Traffic and, and mobility don't go district by district. Uh, depending on where you are, you might have a kid's soccer game or you got to go to school or you got a job over here. You might cross five city council districts and two county commission uh, precincts in your day. Uh, people don't look at mobility based on, on kind of voter jurisdictions or taxing jurisdictions. It's about use. So if, if you look at our project plan, there's both the city piece and then there's the regional piece. The city piece is what we're currently the most focused on because our partner at the city has said, we want to, and they've actively said, we want to be Cap Metro's partner to build our transit infrastructure in the city. We are working with other partners uh, in, the, in the more suburban or the regional area. So we have currently an agreement with Round Rock. We do transit service in Leander and Maynard. Pflugerville is looking to have an agreement with us. At Cap Metro, I could say very openly, we will work with any of our regional partners that would like to advance transit for our larger Central Texas community. I think people generally don't understand the complication of how it's been set up about taxing. Uh, an entity literally has to say, we want to be involved. So Cap Metro can't just go run service in a community that's not part of the Cap Metro service area or doesn't contract with Cap Metro. But we are open and we want to do the work with as many people as possible. I think on the plan, you'll see a lot of parking rides and those parking rides, there's two phases. One is within the city. There's some stuff down by the Wildflower Center. I know you mentioned Southwest down there and how we could do a great parking ride, express bus service. Uh, just look at Howard Lane, we want to expand that and we want to look at 22, 22. Those, those would be very similar to Lake Line. Second phase could be larger park and rides, uh, and as 35 and other roadways get put together, more in the region. But that, that's more of the technical answer regarding that. Uh, look like Commissioner Trevelyan may want to add something, or, or Council Member Harper Madison. I think probably both of us. <laughs> I will defer to Commissioner Trevelyan because I think he's been fighting this fight for over a decade. So he's got something that he can certainly offer that I, I, will, I, will, I will defer. Well, you're kind and generous. Um, I, I would say, I would say first that what we have tried to do is uh, look into our outlying areas 
to determine what their problems are and see what, what types of problems we can solve through transit. Uh, so one area that we looked at was the Colony Park area. When you look on the east side of 183, um, you, you don't have a great deal of, of routes there. So we're trying to figure out ways to expand in that area. One thing that we did was the county invested $330,000, which attracted uh, $200,000 uh, from the FTA. And what we did with those resources was we tried to uh, address uh, creating, uh, creating uh, direct routes uh, that people could get uh, transit to healthcare opportunities. We wanted to make sure uh, that we uh, laid out clinics. We, we, uh, we had a healthcare clinic set up at uh, Overton Elementary School. Uh, there was another one that was set out on uh, 71 and 973. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we created partnerships with existing school districts. Maynard is a school district that we work with. Del Valley is another school district that we work with. We wanted to make sure that people understood uh, that if they lived in the city limits, they had access to the Metro access system. And, and we worked with Cap Metro to define what that access was. When we got beyond Metro access system, uh, we worked with the Capital Area Rural Transit Foundation in, in the Weberville area, in the Austin Colony area, to make sure that people knew uh, that, that uh, if they lived in rural areas, they had uh, a number that they could call. We also worked with the United Way to expand the 2-1 service uh, so that people could call 2-1-1 and get access uh, to clinics as well. So what we've tried to do is work with service providers who serve those areas and build partnerships and invest in places that could A, find federal matches or B, uh, find uh, local foundation matches and begin to provide some of those services uh, that those communities desperately need. Thank you, Natasha. Did you want to add something? Okay. All right. Well, then we'll move on. Randy, uh, you with several lines as part of the plan, what can we expect in terms of the phasing sequencing of the proposed rail lines? And how can we share input on that moving forward? I'm Which sorry, lines Ron, will be first actually, off? I'm sorry. Oh, there we are. Unmute myself. I'm sorry. There you uh, go. My apologies. I, I think uh, I think my colleague, uh, Commissioner Trevelyan, said most of what I otherwise would have said. But I, I would like to say, just for the record, um, We've been having this conversation for 50 years, right? You know, finally seeing something that addresses our complete transit needs would be helpful. And I think one of the questions that you asked about um, the equity component, right? Like, if we could connect the Expo Center, Colony Park, LBJ High School to Mueller and downtown and have first class service. Uh, that would obviously be a big boost for the Eastern Crescent. So I, I just want to make sure to put that on the record. Um, again, like I said, you know, Council or uh, Commissioner Trevelyan, he, he said a lot of what I otherwise would have said. But I, I do want to make sure to say this. To make transit work, we are going to need to provide safe connections to bus stops. I think that's a thing that we don't have enough conversations about. I'm very much looking forward to talking about headwalks and pedestrian infrastructure and making sure that as we build along these corridors that we're supporting new bus services by way of making certain that we're offering people the opportunity um, the opportunity to get there safely perfect thank you so much natasha i'm going to segue into what you were just asking there or talking about i should say we can get back to randy on that other question but yep. this question from another audience member Will Project Connect include sidewalk improvements and other improvements for individuals with disabilities? For sure, Ron, why don't I take that and I'll add it to the, the phasing okay. kind of all, all, all Sounds together. Sounds good. Um, there, I've said it very clearly many, many times. Um, I, uh, maybe it's because I live in the Northeast and a lot of those cities have been there for a couple hundred years now. I'm not saying every sidewalk in the greater Northeast area is perfect because of frost and a lot of heaves, but I will say I was, was surprised when I moved here the quality of our sidewalk infrastructure. We have a long way to go and we need to improve our sidewalk infrastructure. You cannot have a great transit system unless you have a good sidewalk uh, infrastructure system. It's just not possible. So 
sidewalks done correctly, all are ADA compliant. Tra Cap Metro is 99.9% ADA compliant. It was one of the first in the country to get there. Uh, there's like one or two stops that are just physically impossible because of some uh, hill topography. Uh, but most cities in America are nowhere near that. So what we have, we are in good shape, but we need to do much more on active transportation, sidewalks, cycling, all of those things. And I know Jacob had a slide that showed how much investment would be in that. So whether it's the orange line, the blue line, whatever line, um, purple lines, sidewalks would be an improvement along those corridors to get people to the transit uh, station, whether it's a bus stop or a light rail stop. As far as sequencing, again, projectconnect.com, probably the best place to get this, on March 9th, and we made a, a slight change that the, the June 10th work session will pick up with the goal line, but we did a sequencing plan. So all of this is based on available resources. So if someone gave us $10 billion tomorrow, we still couldn't do it all at once, right? You can't build, a, you can't build the roof of your house if you don't have a foundation. So I'll walk run on how you build. We don't have enough construction staff. You can't rip the whole city up at the same time. The federal government doesn't give their component at the same time. And by the way, we don't have all the money at once. So all of those factors means that we have to be a logical sequence. Sequence is gonna be based on where we get the most transit value per dollar spent. That's how, that's how sequencing works. So for us on that big large map plan, it's where are we gonna have the best you know, at least initially, land use and transportation nexus to get the largest uh, ridership gain per dollar that's available, both capital, capital and operating. So some people have asked about gold line, and will the gold line go before the orange and blue? That, and I guess there was some controversy about it back in 2014 about all that. I can't speak to what happened in 14. All I can tell you is, in our sequencing plan for March 9th, and you'll see an update for June 10th, it is very clear that the orange line and the blue line uh, we're recommended definitely to build before the gold line. The gold line has long-term definite growth value in this community and the Campo long-range model shows that corridor having significant population and business growth, but there's no question the orange and blue have to come before that based on the current population and the current job access and as Natasha said, current healthcare and, and education access. That's, those are our main streets in the city. A nuance there that, I, you know, it's important we put this out because everything has to be factual and transparent. We've had some people say you should build the orange line before the blue and this, then, and, and everyone has their own ideas. A lot of this has to be driven just not just the financial part I mentioned, but there's technical components. And a good example of a technical component would be somewhere we'll need to build a rail maintenance facility. And right now our general thoughts that would be around the airport because on the orange line between 183 and Ben White, we just can, we don't seem to have an identified spot for a rail maintenance facility. So in our mind, the orange and blue have to be built at the same time together. And that's what we've been working through from a technical team, because those two, two lines, we get a lot of economies of scale and really uh, get a lot, of, a lot of benefit for our community doing those at the same time. Uh, at June 10th, we'll show a different, an updated sequencing plan to show how all the lines kind of come together. Hey, Randy, this has been a tremendous conversation, and we got so many questions from people who are watching, but we're about out of time. Actually, we're over time right now, but it's been so good and so engaging. We just want to ask one final question and wrap up with our, our guest here on our panel and with Randy. And uh, Natasha, I'll start with you, and Jeff, you can answer afterwards, and then Randy, if you will close it out. Why do you think the community should support Project Connect? Um, thank you for deferring to me. I love to get called on first. <laughs> so I will say that, again, I've already said this, we've all already said this, we cannot move forward. Like if we're thinking about the overall greater good of our, of our community, of the city, of, of all the people, and, and recognizing we have equity issues in the city of Austin. We don't acknowledge and or transcend equity issues in the city of Austin if we don't think about development, if we don't think about transit, if we don't think about them, how they're, you know, symbiotic, so to speak. So I think in my mind's eye, we can't afford to not make this investment, frankly. Um, and I, I really appreciate all my colleagues on the, on the line today. I think some of the folks who are dialing in and, and making their comments don't recognize these people work so hard for y'all. I, I really just want to, say shout out to everybody who I know is not sleeping and <laughs> not eating well. <laughs> and uh, thank y'all.
because it, it only happens if we all do it together. Thank you. Jeff? Well, uh, I think that we have to look at uh, Project Connect as investment in the community. I think we have to look at the fact that not only will it uh, move people to the places where they need to work, where they need to get services, uh, uh, how they get to the hospital, it will also provide significant jobs over time. If we are able to invest in, in our community, if we're able to work and understand our primary transit problems and use this investment to address them, I think that, uh, that we build the type of trust that's necessary in the, in the community to continue to invest in other things. I think uh, making sure that we honestly talk about what our challenges are, that we talk about some of our historical blind spots, uh, that we really sit at the table and talk about how we move forward together. And, and if, we can, if we can build a dialogue, if we can build trust in one another, if we can invest in problems that we know are there, uh, then I think that we can do a lot of good in this city for a long time. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Yeah, well, lost, Randy? Well, first of all, again, thank you, Rob. Thanks for hosting. I want to thank the staff, both our Capital Metro staff and the city staff. And I can't thank uh, Councilmember Harper uh, Madison enough for what she said. I, I'm so proud of this team. This team has been working nonstop for basically two years for this community, for this plan. At the end of the day, we have the privilege to run the transit system, but it's a community system. And people like me will come and go. Ideally, I'm here for a long time. But we come and go, and at the end of the day, it's a community system. And we're trying to put something together that is beyond multi-generation. So if you have a five-year-old at home today, this is the thing when they're my age sitting back saying, thank Thank God our elders did something right that we have a better city that addresses all these needs. You know, we're, we're one of the last holdouts in America to do a large in, uh, investment in, in, tra in urban transportation. And if we want to be economically competitive, uh, we have to think about that. So, you know, your land use policy and your transportation policy are ultimately your long-term economic development policy. And if we don't get those two things right as a community, we will have long-term big issues on affordability, equity, and we can't deal with the serious impending climate change issue as well. So um, thank you for everyone that was uh, attending. We want all the feedback we can get, projectconnect.com. We look forward to doing, I think we have uh, five or six more of these. We'll have a June 10th uh, joint work session, our joint session and then uh, more conversations throughout the summer. And then ultimately we're looking, hopefully policymakers will decide what they want to advance for an investment later this year. But, you know, uh, I, I just really appreciate people taking their time to be so engaged in their community's future. So thank you. Thank you much, Randy. And with that, we've covered a great deal of information today and received some really good questions and feedback. But if we didn't get to what you were asking and all that, we've got, uh, we've got you covered here. Uh, we're going to get your questions answered. It's going to be included in the uh, FAQ document that's posted on the Project Connect website. We'd like to thank all of our discussion leaders for sharing their insights today, especially uh, Travis County Commissioner and Board Member Jeff Trevilian and Austin City Council Member Natasha Harper-Madison. Thank you for your input and insight. Today, by the way, has been the second in our virtual community meeting series. These are going to go on all month long on Facebook Live, or you may be watching us on Zoom right now. Next virtual community meeting will be tomorrow afternoon. As Randy said earlier in the in the uh, virtual meeting, that we're, we're we're putting on these on at different times of the day, so people many as many people as possible can catch us. So the next one's going to be tomorrow, May nineteenth at five in the afternoon. Y los que hablan español no se mortifican. We got you covered too. Our Spanish language virtual community meeting is going to be on Thursday, May the 21st, uh, first at 6 o'clock uh, via Univision. They're going to be carrying it on Facebook Live, and we'll have more details there. We invite you, your friends and neighbors, to visit projectconnect.com to find all the upcoming meetings and the virtual open house, which you can visit anytime through May 31st. So with that, we'd like again to thank you for being part of this afternoon's conversation. We look forward to hearing your feedback. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Oliveira.